Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I took the week off last weekend because I went to a wedding in Madison, Wisconsin. It was pretty fun. Um, uh, it was a traditional Hindu wedding uh, in the uh, various different locations. It was a four-day celebration. There's a lot of different things happening there. Um, yeah, it was a great experience, and I got, and I got to play the uh, ceremonial conch. I don't know if it was a prank or not, but I went along with it. So let's jump right in, and we're going to talk about some of the things that I'm basically playing some catch-up. And it's crazy news kind of happening out of Russia with the whole mutiny rebellion ended, and not only was the leader of Wagner Group not punished, he was kind of brought to pledge his re or re-pledge his allegiance to Vladimir Putin. I mean, he speculated that Yagaviv, uh, Prodrojin and his Wagner group were told to disband and the leader to be sent to Bulgaria where he would remain as a, a kind of a refugee, a, uh, a kind of like, uh, what's that called, uh, banished from Russia, but, you know, which, you know, which handled, which uh, handled, which also handled the tra um, transition of the Wagner group, but according to the New York Times, uh, Prodrojin uh, met with Putin days after the 24-hour rebellion, showing in many ways how Putin needs the Wagner Group and their private military uh, services. This is very reminiscent of the two-tiered justice system that protects the rich and powerful, and people who have spoken out have been arrested and sentenced to 10 years. But in this case of a clear rebellion and Russian blood was spilled when he took uh, the town from the Russians to simply get what would be considered a slap on the wrist. Um, so I can imagine saying, I know you betrayed me, don't do it again, which was the basis of the three-hour meeting with Putin. This, according to Russian state sources, seems to be, the, uh, be a tantrum and wish to move forward. Too many people died needlessly on the Russian side that only fanned the flames of rebellion when mixing with general military with the Wagner, Wagner's private mercenaries. This has got to be one of the weirdest stories. Uh, speaking of weird stories, uh, the United States is going through a heat wave and some people are kind of leaning into it. AP News reported that visitors to Death Valley National Park, America's largest natural preserve with around 50, uh, 300 square miles is seen visitors during these hotter times. With temps averaging 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 48 degrees Celsius, this area does not recommend more than 30 minutes of exposure to this dry, hot, warm air and even warmer winds. Some reports of over 130 degrees uh, in the area as well. People are a glutton for punishment and many signs recommend people avoid hiking after 10 a.m. in those areas. Uh, some students, um, in other news, some students Feeling the heat from student loans may be getting some relief if you borrowed federally. So with SCOTUS blocking the Biden's uh, wide range debt relief and now some loopholes have found that the federal government can waive debt if students took federal student loans. Uh, so Friday's $39 billion for $800,000 adds considerable heft to the Biden's administration previous debt relief efforts now totaling at least $116 billion and illustrates how the Education Department can offer targeted relief to vulnerable borrowers even if this Supreme Court uh, recent rebuck. Uh, so, you know, that's just kind of what's happening here that looks like they found a loophole and they're looking to uh, dive into this uh, federal loan forgiveness. This is part of the uh, government's ID, uh, IDRs, which represents the uh, idea that government income driven repayment plans. Um, and this is just an uh, idea that they're um, uh, looking into as well as they're moving forward with this. So let's get back to Missoula, uh, which is itself is maybe seeing uh, 100 degree temperatures by next weekend. Uh, big news happening with the Missoula Midtown Master Plan as it has been adopted by city and staff to bring the Midtown into a new destination, much like the downtown encourage bike pad safety among folks living in the large part of Missoula from Rose Park all the way past to Reserve Street. Uh, in the Southgate Mall, uh, Missoula Fairground areas. As towns grow in the past, downtowns were left empty because of malls, and then box stores such as Walmart and Costco kind of took the uh, businesses from the malls as well. And so as we started getting a little bit more variety, people started to become more downtown as a destination rather than a shopping district. And, and so now the city is looking to put their thumbprint in many neighborhoods, including the much needed Franklin to the Fort, which has seen many war changes over the last year. The fighting forts, um, <laughs> biggest change in the middle lane for public transit via a uh, mountain line, uh, via um, Brook Street or 93 at uh, Midtown home prices have gone up more than 74% since the planning process began the three years ago and rent prices have increased 50% over the last 10 years. Housing remains a major part 
a major issue across the city and Midtown could help provide some more supply with multi-story development in these areas. Missoula in many ways is investing in the future and Missoula's redevelopment agency have been using what's considered a tax increment financing funding to leverage development to create affordable housing on the gamble of future taxes rather than the immediate needs uh, for the city cannot just make lives uh, of their citizens easier the day of. So it's, uh, it's kind of like the pothole scenario in which you know there's a pothole, but the city doesn't always drive the same streets as you, so you need, they need your input. Simply leaning into the city to figure it out for you is not the way to uh, stay active in your community. And the Mid Midtown Master Plan has done a lot of uh, uh, outreach to a lot of folks with these uh, very big concerns, which is why they're kind of leaning into more or, uh, uh, or affordable housing, safer areas, safer streets. Not to mention they're going to go after their old monster, South Avenue through Book Street on that malfunction junction because there's so many different roads going through there between Russell and everything like that. So, um, <clears throat> so we're about a month away, a um, uh, month into the park ban and overnight camping and even go so far to put a fence around the YWCA secret second store saw a major decrease in the visible homeless. However, during the late night Monday meeting, the ban on parks saw it tabled. Um, I'll talk a little bit about more study council report, but with plenty of back and forth, many people alluding to the bad actors regardless of homelessness status are to blame and amendments were proposed and overall ban was tabled. I mean, like I said, I will talk about this. This is still an ongoing thing with this emergency meal levy to reopen the Johnson Street shelter within a couple months as the city tries to find staffing and stuff like that. The city is only able to work with partnerships who can actually provide these services, so they have to have a downstream effect of giving their money to the right organizations to organize and create these kinds of things as well. Um, another big issue happening is the Smurf Stone and the testing being done after years of uh, being ignored by the EPA uh, in late June uh, to discuss the proposal for additional sampling of the groundwater, sludge, ponds, and wastewater treatment areas in the site. While uh, she, uh, they have yet to see any work plans, the potential res uh, responsible parties did respond to with a proposal to do additional work. Waters rise and fall, and since the plant closed, many folks in the Frenchtown and certain areas have been concerned about the contamination to the rivers and wells in the area. Um, and so far, they plan to look at doing some more testing starting in September the, or uh, the fall at the latest. So another big item is newspapers. So the Missoulian is yet dealing with yet another big cut uh, rather than losing their offices and being relocated to a, a printing press in Helena. Now the post office will uh, basically take up the reins and deliver newspapers uh, to the throughout the city of Missoula using their services, but at a uh, scaled back version of everything. So instead of having daily newspapers, we're expecting to have um, three newspapers a week, most likely uh, um, from what I speculate is that it's going to be the Sunday print is going to still be available and then there's probably going to be a midweek one and then the end of the week kind of one as well. Uh, the Iowa-based Iowa Lee Enterprises have shrunk the paper over the years since selling the Missoulian offices for real estate. Um, the major change and frankly the Missoulian and many of the news outlets will have to evolve whether it be increasing online fees uh, overing a hyperactive web presence and social media presence that was once scoffed at has become a standard for news, entertainment, and information at this time. New York Times is a good uh, model for a lot of these uh, newspaper publications kind of moving forward in continuation as well, while other news publications like the Wall Street Journal has had second life through uh, the powers of Jeff Bezos, uh, to be specifically. Um, latest news, this is a big thing that's happening as well in the state of Montana because there's our taxable rates and everything like that. The state is up for housing appraisal and taxes, reflective value of your home and commercial properties. Nationally, pricing has only gone up and many folks in, in and around Missoula visited the property assessment town hall to talk about the assessment and what it meant for your property taxes. MCAT covered the town hall meeting, so you can find this whole meeting on MCAT's YouTube channel, MCAT TV Missoula. Keyword is the property assessment town hall. Taxable value is often tied up to property taxes, and as a result, cost of living go up in conjunction with the local taxes and rent for folks too. And so far, the statewide effort, and they assess based on trends and areas which allow for adjustment for folks to complain and request reassignments to save money on, on um, in the long run. So imagine you have a commercial property and there's nothing built on it, and yet you're paying the commercial uh, property taxes. You could get a leeway and get a reassessment for the property as well, so you don't have to pay as much of the taxes. Uh, kind of like what in some cases some uh, local property taxes were able to implement a ways for uh, undeveloped commercial land for their tax owners to be like, we won't pay these taxes unless we decide to develop. But that is another circumstance regardless of the statewide reassessments of your housing. So that's kind of like one example of how 
you could complain to the state because they just do a metric, they do the numbers, they see the land, they're just like, oh, it's commercial value. And based on the value of something that already exists next door to it, which is like $1.2 million in, you know, the development of this new like condo right next to it, this property therefore has that same kind of taxable value, but there's nothing on it. So they ergo, you know, you'd have, you'd have to go to the state, which the state will have to go back down there and reassess the site. So there's a lot of this going to be happening going on here as well. And one of the bigger questions has to do with the times we live in. This has been a very weird time with home values going up during this pandemic based on trends and not so much steady growth in Missoula once projected. Uh, actual growth may, may, may not be accounting for the speculative growth that has some folks asking these kinds of questions. Josh Slotnick spoke about these previous programs this week about everything you need about the 2023 tax season, how it deals with the mill and how it deals with the caps of our taxes. And here's some of the footage of this. And when I get back, we're going to be talking about some of the movies that are coming out. So without further ado, here is Josh Slotnick, county commissioner, talking about the taxes. And he's been talking pretty uh, regularly about them as well. So here he is. Assessed value times the tax rate equals taxable value. Taxable value times last year's millage, number of mills, equals an estimate of this year's tax rate. Now, given what you know, how could that do now? <laughs> Why is that number so inaccurate? It's wildly inaccurate. Anybody have a guess? Remember I said there was a cap? We can only go up, we can only do what we did last year plus the half, half the three-year average of inflation. If we took the same number of bills as we used last year and multiplied them times this, year's, times this year's tax rate, we would crush the mill cap. We would go hundreds of yards beyond the mill cap. For the first time that I know of, we're actually gonna assess fewer mills this year, probably 25% fewer mills than we did last year. I know this is complicated and I'm bummed about it. Yes, oh my god, yes. If I could give you a perfect good if I could give you a giant gold star, you absolutely 100% nailed it. Do you mind saying that again loudly? I already forgot. Oh the value of each mill has gone up so much they won't need as many mills. Exactly. The value of a mill went up so much. If we used the same number of mills as we did last year, we would go way beyond the mill cap. Way beyond the milk cap. We don't we don't can't. The state says the milk cap can't. Like it would be illegal. Not only was that number on your on that letter you got inaccurate and scary, it also was it was offering a number out that was illegal. We literally could not do that. We would be in violation of the state law. I don't know what the penalty would be, but it wouldn't be good. All right, so there's a little taste of Josh Lennick talking about some of the legality of the tax system, how we're having less mills and like just like property values and stuff like that, how it relates to taxes and everything like that. So there's a lot more to this that you can look into as well moving forward. But I'm moving forward with my next segment where I call Pre-Critic as we jump right into the movies. The movie's so built up for so long, it got delayed multiple, multiple times and even getting an early release date this week. So it's been out since Wednesday, part, part one of a five hour experience, probably more than five hours. Tom Cruise brings you back to the movies yet again with his ex-wife shepherd you into the theaters with her return to the movies, Nicole Kidman, by the way. I'm excited to see the sequel, uh, Nicole Kidman, not necessarily the Tom Cruise or, or dad movie, but if you want to have an excuse to spend time with your dad and not have to deal with any awkward silences. This movie is for boomers and for you. Mission, Impo Mission, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, part one. Watch as a 60 year old Greek god of a man hooks up with the ladies um, and fights the bad guys who have there, been there since the beginning. And in the beginning, the of the end of movies that has Tom Cruise stunts worth the price of admission. And when the movie slows down to the, to the plot, you're kind of like, uh, let's get to the ne ac next action set piece so we don't have to actually talk about the story because it has to, something to do with like some kind of um, supercomputer that can predict the future because it uses algorithms or something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's a lot scarier and more explained in the movie, but that's what you can expect from this movie evil AI and evil bad guys too working with it. So theater camp, have you ever wondered what it would be like to watch a movie about the inner workings of a summer theater camp? Me neither, because I can attest that 
there was always kids vying for attention. It's like the Super Bowl of, look at me, look at me. Why haven't you looked at me for the last two seconds? This movie will have all the glamour of summer camps and none of the disenfranchised kids who get to be a tree in their upcoming theater camp show for their parents who already paid for the camps to buy tickets. Anyways, it's your basic rundown theater on its last leg getting a B-12 shot through enthusiastic kids and counselors to save the theater trope we all know too well. Then we got this next movie coming out. It's called The Miracle Club. You like those boomer gal movies with Jane Fonda and company. Kathy Bates is dipping her toes in the shallow plots of gal pals on vacation to live, laugh, and love. It's great because when you watch uh, the man's movies, it always seems to be a midlife crisis related to one last ride. But these movies are very much like, hey, let's just have a fun time, have a vacation. We might get a sequel. And those are this movie, The Miracle Club. Uh, then we have The Flood. I think I've talked about this like three different times over the last year or two, but it just doesn't seem to get released. But watch this guy from Starship Troopers has to deal with alligators and a prison escape that was going according to plan until a flood and alligators came a chomping. There isn't much to the story. You'll have characters who just so happen to be there from bad guys to wrongfully accused protagonists fighting their way through the bad guys, corrupt deputies, and their own personal trauma of letting their tragic wife die tragically or something. Those are the movies that are coming out this weekend and as well. Um, up next, I have a brand new dub and stuff. This is from the uh, uh, old cartoon from 1966, Dino Boy in Danger River. <laughs> Prime, we must follow. I agree, we must get those chicken nuggets. That doesn't sound like any dinner bell. I agree. Uh, that's Uber Prime and his goons. Chicken nuggets? Mm, that is a favorite of the Uber clan. Give us back those nuggets. They're ours. Never! Yeah! Oh! Hush now! We'll protect those chicken nuggets. Hmm. He might be dead, but we can still salvage the nuggets. The precious nuggets. Come on, Uber Prime. Did I hear something about chicken nuggets? Well, I only knew to deliver the meal. I didn't know there were chicken nuggets. Should we go get those nuggets? Remember what I said about chicken nuggets. They must be eaten and not worshipped. That is why society collapsed in the great Uber Can War. Can you imagine if we had the nuggets? You know nothing about that, you insolent boy. Don't you agree we must get the nuggets before the Ubers? Hmm. We better eat them, or I will alone. Oh boy, I can't wait to taste those chicken nuggets. I wonder if they come with sauce. They always forget the sauce. Times never change. Oh look, is th are those the nuggets? They look like nuggets. Like sea nuggets. Look at them. Bouncing up and down. Like nuggets. Oh no! It's the uh, octopus! Ugh. Oh no! They smell the uh, nuggets on him! Uh, help me! Oh! Thank hmm. you! We're not out of the woods now, chaps. At least there's no murder hornets. Oh! I spoke too soon! He's trying to honey glaze the chicken nuggets! Hit the deck! Baseball! Alright, everyone. Eyes on the sky. We can handle one. Don't let that stinger touch you. Everyone down! Hmm. Uh, huh, looks like we got lucky this time, chaps. Whoever thought the thing preying on us would be preyed upon? Mm, quiet, Dino Boy. Let's get those nuggets. And if you're wondering, yes, I did basically steal that from the uh, Geico Caveman commercials. All right, so up next we have City Council. And so this one, uh, you, you mean 
spoiler alert, they already tabled the uh, park ban, and so City County was off last week. So, uh, and so was I. The meeting dove into the emergency ordinance that would have put a restriction on overnight camping, and one of the biggest arguments against it would be where would these people go? Uh, the city has evicted folks from safe outdoor spaces, um, when the, uh, then the winter shelter because it was a seasonal thing, and then overall uh, had this, you, uh, oof. O overall this idea of you can't be here kind of efforts rather than the overall creating a space. But when you create a space, you also create liability in that space in which the city doesn't want to deal with that kind of liability with creating the space. And they don't necessarily have the uh, partnership or the staffing to put money in towards. And so it's all, it's, Honestly, it comes down to money and nobody wants to spend the money on this particular thing. I hate to say it so frankly, but it kind of seems like there's no money going towards this and and there's no place for these people to go. So we're going to kick things off. Daniel Carlino talks about this a little bit further and this is what he had to say. Martin v. Boise and, you know, Johnson versus Grant Pass, um, those decisions, you know, upheld our Eighth Amendment constitutional rights uh, to ensure that people aren't getting um, cruel and unusual punishments and excessive fines. And I'm wondering, um, and, they, and they stated that we w each community would need an adequate number of shelter beds for the amount of people that are living homeless in that community. Otherwise, those communities would be breaking um, uh, our Eighth Amendment rights and these Ninth Circuit Court rulings. So could you, uh, could you tell us how the city, you know, forcibly removing people from one place to the next isn't breaking our um, Eighth Amendment constitutional rights and these court rulings, even though that we don't have adequate shelter beds for everybody in town. And I think we've got our city attorney online. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. I apologize. My camera's not working. Um, I, I don't think that's uh, an accurate reading of the Johnson v. Grants Pass decision or the Boise decisions. And, and I recognize that there are you know, legal scholars that are going to disagree um, with that conclusion, and, and that's fine. There are attorneys in cases throughout the country on opposite sides of issues that uh, read the case law and statutes differently. But, uh, you know, my reading of the uh, Johnson case as amended by the amended opinion that came out earlier this week, um, I think makes it pretty clear that, you know, as long as there is some city space that's a city public property where homeless people can sleep overnight uh, legally, that the city can close um, things like public parks. The, the Ninth Circuit again uh, cited a case um, in the Johnson majority opinion uh, where the city of Kauai in Hawaii closed city parks to camping or some city parks to camping and the court there district court there said that uh, you know they could do that as long as there were some places some city property that was available for overnight camping the ninth circuit cited that case with seeming approval uh so again i, I as i have said repeatedly as long as there is some city property that it's available and and as Ms. gockler pointed out there would be after this ordinance in place i think we would be in compliance with the decision uh in the amended um uh, Johnson beat Grants Pass decision and, and the other Ninth Circuit precedent. Okay. So that was Ryan Sudsbury uh, responding to Daniel Carlino, and he is the new city attorney who took, basically took over for Jim Nugent. Um, um, the, state, the, the law states that if there is a place for people to go in the parks, they can be closed. Um, and Missoula has plenty of open space to go towards, but this is, according to the city, smaller section of the city to close to prevent urban camping in public parks owned by the city. Travis Matier, during public comment, talks about some of the spacing. Um, I want to speak to the idea of adequate shelter beds because I think um, for people that haven't spent seven years working inside of a homeless shelter, um, seeing programs like the Salcedo Center up close and personal, I think there might be a misunderstanding about what adequate shelter beds means. It means a somewhat safe place where you don't get sexually assaulted and killed. So uh, you really need to take a look at past programs and what's happened in, ter in terms of safety issues before you just think that finding a, a, a warehouse somewhere uh, is going to be an adequate facility. You need properly trained staff. 
you need uh, trained staff that are getting paid an adequate amount of money. So you can't just stand up a facility in a short amount of time. So the, the previous commenter that made the public comments about how there just has to be a place. Yeah, there's a lot of empty storefronts. There's a lot of potential empty facilities that maybe could help out the situation. Is there staffing? How long is it going to be um, for getting training? I went to City Club earlier today. We have a drug crisis. Uh, what you're seeing in public parks is part of that drug crisis. I take lots of opportunities to thank parks and Rec staff who are cleaning up needles and other dangerous items that they didn't get involved in Parks and Rec uh, to, to, to be doing. Okay. And so that was Travis Matier talking about some of the uh, frustrations of just not basically having an adequate staffing or having folks in place to uh, um, just kind of adequately do their job just to uh, serve the homeless as well. So um, this is the rub because it's not easy to open shelter, provide services without money and grants are not permanent revenues, which we clearly saw from ARPA funds that basically were the feeding tube of many of these organizations to open the Johnson Street Shelter, have the adequate uh, Rogers International Security, um, not to mention the, uh, um, the other safe outdoor space that they have next to the Walmart across from where they had the original encampment off the reserve street encampment under the re underneath the reserve street bridge. Darren, Ofte Darren Aronofsky speaks on this matter uh, on this park ban. Is this what he had to say? If you're going to allow people to sleep on sidewalks and in parking lots, and let me focus on sidewalks, it's not going to take very long to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, YWCA store mini camps all over Broadway and other conspicuous parts of the city. Is that really what you want? I think not. That's not a good option. Number one, where are they going to go? Even if they can legally sleep on sidewalks all over the city, who's going to tell them they can sleep on the sidewalks uh, or in parking lots in the city? Th that's something, by the way, that the lower court in uh, Grants Pass is also required to address the due process claims of removing people that were not decided by the Ninth Circuit, because the Ninth Circuit said we don't have to we don't have to deal with that because we're sending this whole thing back to the district court to deal with it. So somewhere in there, when you start kicking people out of Lions Club and other parks where they're camping, and not telling them where they can go, you've got a major legal problem, folks. All right. And then, of course, uh, David Aronofsky said that, uh, you know, it's it's all fine and dandy to uh, basically throw up a park ban and everything like that. But once you actually get into the practicality of enforcing it, um, that's when things get a little bit more muddier, especially if like whether or not you're going to give them just tickets or citations or you're literally going to be tearing down their camps um, and indeed forcing them to leave. And in many ways, a lot of the cleanup crews basically just destroy these camps altogether. And from what Aronofsky was saying is that this is setting up to be dangerous precedent that is in, that is in for, that is not enforceable and will not work practically and aims to be more political than actual laws in place. Uh, Shai Engstrom um, from uh, a former a library employee talks about the limited space and uh, her own experiences working at the library. Unfortunately, um, things that can be used um, in courts against these folks um, simply for existing. And there are a lot of things I think you guys can maybe understand as a punishment for existing. But um, again, working in the library, every single person I talked to who was unhoused was only there because they had nowhere else to go where they wouldn't get kicked out for not buying a coffee or for not asking for the restroom key or doing things that we all get the grace of doing but because they don't have a house to go back to every day at 8 p.m. when a library closes, six, um, three, week, three days out of the week, and 4 p.m. on Sundays, um, they go to parks, and they go under bridges, and they go on the sides of the streets. Um, and I think I speak for a lot of people in Missoula, a lot of your constituents, uh, when I say that um, I would much rather see people in tents with a couple pieces of garbage um, than anywhere else that is available for them, which is not a lot of places. All right, so that was Shai uh, Engstrom talking a little bit more about that. Uh, Jill Bonney, executive director of the Paul Varela Center, had this to say about the matter in terms of the park ban. I understood where everybody was coming from with the emergency ordinance, um, but really since that has happened, we've seen Russell Street, 
cleared the Pop neighborhood, Lions Park, and people are now at Kim Williams. And so just to give you a little bit of perspective on, on what's happening up there, people are drinking from the river because they don't have any other water to drink. So there's no, no food or water or access to those things. Um, people are having medical emergencies and they don't have cell phones, so they can't call 911. And medical EMS personnel can't get to them easily. I don't know if you're aware, but you know, n you can't take motorized vehicles up there. So the homeless outreach team and other outreach workers are having a lot of trouble getting to people and getting supplies to them. They've talked about taking bikes, but need to have bike trailers with them. Um, and then the homeless outreach team has also been telling people to please leave a small footprint to spread out, to not be in big areas altogether, um, which is what it seems like they've done up the Kim Williams, but now that area is going to be cleared. So several things are happening. One, people are losing trust with the homeless outreach team. And so we're going to lose ground with the people we're working with. People can't be found when housing opportunities come open to them. Um, and so what now? Okay. And then we have some solutions coming, like the Blue Heron Permanent Supportive Housing Units, the Johnson Street Shelter, hopefully opening in a couple of months. Um, but I think we can do better. Okay. So that was Jill Bonney uh, talking about some of her own experiences uh, just uh, through the POV and some of the limitations that they even have. April Seat from the Sovereign Hope Rescue Mission talks about the services provided through the uh, Hope Rescue Mission and the uh, Temporary Safe Outdoor Space, which inspired the ideas of just having designated camp areas in the city of Missoula. Temporary Safe Outdoor has is successful. I do think that it's a program surrounded by specific um, folks that we do serve. I do believe that there's options that are available in the future that will be coming to play. So um, I do I do believe that it should be tabled, but I also just wanted to share like how much we are doing, how much is happening, um, and that we can just build, continue to build on what we are doing for the folks that are out there. I also feel like um, when we move people out, it gets harder for us to find them, but I um agree with a lot of things that were said but i also feel like the community needs to understand and see that there are things that are happening and we do have um plenty of people that want to work together to build more solutions um so i just want to thank you all and thank um the ones that who are providing each day to to build new services and resources but i do feel like this should be tabled and we can talk through some more solutions so we also have uh, somebody who has actually been moved from encampment to encampments. Uh, Clayton Shane, a homeless guy, talks about his constant moving and hypocrisy when told uh, what to do and trying to comply with uh, basic rules that kind of just comes out of nowhere, in his opinion. I had a man stand on me the other night, Eric Johnson. He said his name was and that he was there for the property owner, which he seemed to realize was the county. Now, this man was portraying himself as working for the county and stood above me in the night with a firearm on his side and a flashlight so bright that I couldn't see anything for almost two hours, demanding that I leave a stretch of woods where other people were camped, where there has been no issue, where there has been no posting, where there was no health department saying there was a safety issue. I've never been in one camp where the health department has been there but I've been in many camps that have been moved because of health and safety issues. And who's the authority on that? I've had two small spaces now because I was told, don't be in bigger camps, make smaller spaces. I've taken advice on where I should be camping. I took advice from a police officer liaison who told me, if you just move a hundred feet, you'll be on land that shows no landowner. There's no one to tell you to leave. I just went back to that space and found two not notifications and a citation. I got cited at a camp I'm not even at, trying to appease the requests of the police and the city workers that are moving us. By having people together, we can actually help each other. 
feed each other, give an extra raincoat or a bag when you know rainstorm. I mean, it's not like we're not battling elements as well, and it's all catch up. You just cannot organize and get back into the role of life when you're moving constantly. Okay. That was Clayton Ching. Um, another uh, person, um, uh, Mike Robinson, uh, another public comment, talks about the bad actors who have made him and his family fearful of public spaces as a result. And so, you know, with every, you know, you know, yeah. So, yeah, here's Mike Robinson. I, I've lived here a long time. This isn't how Missoula was, and this isn't how Missoula, I don't think, should be. I want people to have a place to live, but how it is right now is not working. <laughs> it's scary, and it's scary for our kids. It's scary for people who live along the river. It's just scary, and I, I'm not offering a solution. And there should be a solution. Um, you know, I want there to be a solution, and if if you provide a solution, I'll 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 support it. Like <laughs> like I volunteer at the POV, I volunteer at the Metal Arc. Like I I would, you know, I would volunteer. I would help a solution. But what's along the river right now is just not sustainable. <clears throat> not sustainable for my kids who live here. My son is he won't fish along the river anymore. That's one of the reasons why we moved to Missoula, right? When he was one year old, he's now 17, is so that he could fish along the river. It's not working. Okay, that was Mike Robinson talking about his frustrations. Um, we go back to uh, more city council reactions to some of the comments and stuff like that. Uh, Mike Nugent, city council, talks about this a little bit further and this is what uh, he had to say. You know, I appreciate all the work that people put in this, and I really do appreciate everybody coming and um, commenting. And I, I hear the frustration because I, I feel like we're, we've got the cart before the horse in some ways, and we're giving mixed messages where there's been a declaration of an emergency, but the solution to that emergency doesn't occur for f several more months. We're we're telling people they can't camp in certain places, but it's okay to go other places. Uh, you know, th those are kind of valid questions. Um, this council discussed the need to have long-term conversations around long-term solutions. And I think tonight's comments make that even more clear. And I think we're all looking forward to that. Um, even though we definitely acknowledge that any solution costs real money, it's not gonna be the city by itself. We're gonna need our uh, private and nonprofit partners um, and, you know, it'd be nice to pair a new shelter with a new low income housing tax credit project uh, and things like that. Um, I just don't see how it's appropriate to take action on this tonight when we still have multiple months of the emergency and we're not providing any other solutions. Okay, so that was Mike Nugent talking uh, some more about some of the frustrations and overall uh, issues that even the city is dealing with right now. There's a lot of uh, things that feel like it's being read between the lines that the city can only help with the means at their disposal. Without a budget, they, it means that, they, pr that providing a place would create a liability and simply shooing people away has been more cost uh, uh, ineffective in the long term. So, uh, Daniel Carlino, City Council uh, talks firsthand at helping folks move from encampments in the Missoula area, and this is his uh, response to it. Um, I went to the Russell Street encampment and helped some people move. Um, I, I helped talk to and organize with people and helped trying to find places for people to move, and then went to the Lions Park Sweep, um, um, the encampment uh, uh, where the city forcibly removed people from the Lions Park. And at that park, I met people that had been sweeped from a different park, and I helped people from that park move with my time rather than we can't pass any good policies here to help i guess we'll have to just help with my hands move people from one place to wherever they can stay next and that's what i did and then they just got forcibly removed from the city again there goes our taxpayer money just moving people from one place to the other and at lions park i counted 18 city staff there if you count council members 20 city staff there at one time 20 city staff 
We could have helped everybody move. We could have used that money to help pay for everybody's apartments. We could have done anything productive rather than just move them from one park to the next park. But that's the policies that we're choosing in this room. And um, this is really barbaric like picture that I got. But this, you can see that the city's paying for a crane or whatever you want to call it to just pick up people's tents with everything that they own inside of their tent and just throw it into the trash. I was talking as we watched this happen at the Lions Park encampment. You know, one person that was living there said, poof, there, there, there goes somebody's entire things, their whole life. Imagine what that would be like. That's absolutely not how I want to spend our taxpayer funds. I think we can be a city that lifts people up, not a city that acts like a bunch of barbarians as policymakers trying to crush people's belongings and steal their things and forcibly remove them from place to place. Okay, so that was Daniel Carlino's reaction to just the consistent movement and just uh, tearing down of these encampments. Uh, he may later mention on that the city uh, would spend upwards of $100,000 to move people from one place to another. Um, even more uh, even more that all services are currently full and have a massive wait list for housing, regardless of many new affordable units that were created through the city and nonprofit centers. Many of the city council didn't like the idea of closing the parks in general, restricting everybody because of groups of people building or pitching structures in parks. Uh, you limit the homeless by limiting everyone who went against many of the city council's ideas. And in the end, this item was further tabled until August 28th. Um, up next, we have some uh, promos and other things uh, running through MCAT as well. So uh, without further ado, here's a little taste of uh, uh, our Saturday drop-ins and um, more of our uh, Saturday dance parties and also uh, tell us something. So here it is. Storytellers for our next live storytelling event. 
The event takes place on September 28th. The theme is Lost in Translation. If you would like to pitch your story for Lost in Translation, call 406-203-4683. The pitch deadline is August 20th. As soon as I hear your pitch, I will call you and let you know that I got it. And from there, if you're selected, we'll workshop our stories together and there is a group workshop. Please pitch your story for Lost in Translation by calling 406-203-4683. Thanks. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. It is the second weekend in July. Uh, let's kick things off with, uh, you know, you have your typical, uh, all your camps that are going on this week as well. A uh, bunch of other things happening as well. If you're interested in um, learning about science and stuff, Spectrum Discovery Center is open at 10 a.m. today uh, just to kind of show some hands-on sign exhibits and museum. Um, family fun time at the uh, various indoor uh, areas w from Roots, Mismo to YMCA, uh, starting around 10, 10.30 a.m. Missoula Food Bank meal distribution from 10 a.m. to about 1 p.m. It's a great way for people to get fresh and nutritious food, not to mention their partnership with Spectrum and the uh, Missoula Public Library through their Empower Place, which is p equal parts community center, food bank, and more. Tiny Tales and Story Time at 10.30 a.m. as always at the Missoula Public Library on the second floor. Uh, lunch at the Missoula Senior Center starting at 11.30 AM. Uh, this is a ongoing event that happens on weekdays through the uh, Missoula Senior Center. It's a great opportunity as well. Not to mention, I believe the uh, Missoula Public Library also does like free lunches uh, starting at 1130 to about 1 p.m. here at the uh, Missoula Public Library on weekdays, Monday through Friday. And anybody, any kids uh, 18 and younger can uh, get a free lunch here at the Missoula Public Library. So yarns is happening at the uh, um, Missoula Public Library. This is on the fourth floor. Uh, watercolor is not happening for the rest of the summer. It will probably come back in the fall. They usually take a summer hiatus. Um, if you like floating, uh, this is a big deal that's happening as well, happening from 12 to 6 p.m. Thursdays through Sundays. It's the U-Dash River sh Shuttle Service. So this takes you from a passenger Bohr campus drive near the outdoor program. Passengers can get dropped off the Sharon in East Missouri or Milltown State Park. Uh, free for you and your inner tube. Uh, VR laser tag, Big Sky Arcadia, two to six people. Big Sky Arcadia is South Gar Southgate Mall is hosting a laser tag this afternoon. Um, Esports gaming meets free roam VR, virtual laser tag in a large play space, allowing players to move freely, creating an immersive and exciting play experience for fun for all ages. Up to six players can go head to head and experience full body free roam VR like never before. Uh, Missoula Lego Club is going to be happening at the uh, Missoula Public Library at 2.30 this afternoon on the second floor. Uh, drop in by the Imaginarium anytime between 2.30 and 5 p.m. to create fantastic Lego structures. Sleeping Beauty, uh, MCT is hosting uh, Sleeping Beauty, uh, Missoula Children's Theater. They have their play this week, and so they're wrapping it up with a 4 p.m. show and a 6 p.m. show uh, tonight at the Missoula Children's Theater. Uh, the Impossible Play Project and Co-ed Comedy Camp, uh, Zootown Arts Community Center is also doing their own camp this week, and so they're doing their performances this July with two in the showroom at the Zach and one in the Wilma courtesy of Logjam Presents. Admission is totally free and there will be a no host bar open for attendees at the Wilma Theater. Come check out the amazing ballets, jokes and plays these kids have written during their time at Zach Camp and then head over to the Top Hat afterwards uh, for uh, fan for uh, all that kind of stuff. Okay, a power, house, a power hour at the Big Sky Arcadia. Big Sky Arcadia, enjoy half off games. Big Sky Arcadia, Monday through Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. Big Sky Arcadia. Uh, cornhole tournament be benefiting the Special Olympics, Imagination Brewing Company, toss some bags and winning prizes while supporting a great cause. $10 per person gets you a beverage. Uh, entry into the double, double, double Elimination Bags Tournament. All ages, all welcome. Uh, Blistered Earth and Ultimate Metallica Show at the Dark Horse Bar starting at 7 p.m. tonight. Twilight Retreat Paint Night is a painting class uh, with a twist register. Um, and this is going to be at uh, painting, with, uh, painting with a Twist at 7 p.m. tonight. Inferno, a death dance ritual, is going to be featured at Zach's and Music as well, 7.30 p.m. Lion Hammer at Monk's um, is going to be playing some music there as well. Kimberly Carson Trio is going to be that old post at 8 p.m. doing some miscellaneous music 
acoustic kind of stuff as well. And those are your Friday night events as we jump right into your Saturday with your markets. Um, you got your people's market, you got your farmer's market, you got the River City market, all happening in the downtown area. You can't miss it. Just follow all the people. And this is where you can get free uh, fresh produce, uh, food trucks, and more. This is an ongoing event ever, happening every single Saturday. So many different times, all the time. DNA Learning uh, Lab Field Day, the Montana Natural History Center, and you can join the Bug Wrangler Brenna for a guided walk through the Rock Creek Confluence area to learn about insect collection techniques. Participants will choose one field day to attend. No breaks for lunch, but participants are welcome to bring uh, snacks and stay as long as they like after the field day continues, and that's at 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Um, they have different specific days for this, but this is a special one for their learning lab talking about bugs. Uh, Shakespeare and Company presents Satya Doyle Bayok. William uh, Shakespeare and Company is hosting Ready by Celebrated Author and Helgit High School graduate. Uh, this is happening from, at 10 a.m. A practicing psychotherapist and founding director of the Salome Institute of Jungian Studies. Uh, she will be reading uh, from Quarter Life, The Search for Self in Early Adulthood. Uh, it was part of Random House Publication 2022. Coffee and pastries from Bernice's Bakery will be available. This event is open and free of charge. So, uh, sew party. So, Zootown Community Center is doing a sewing party uh, workshop at, at 10 um, to about 12.30 p.m. This is a $60 uh, entry collection of silk screen stamps or paper stencil. Students will print their own unique fabric. After the printmaking portion, students will use the Zach sewing equipment to craft their own custom pot holders. Print shop will remain open for three hours following the workshop so participants can continue their work. Museum tour, ma'am. Uh, uh, Missoula Art Museum is doing a museum tour with a uh, lead tour at Museum Art Museum starting at 11 a.m. every Saturday. Stop by after the farmer's market. This is a casual fun way to experience the exhibit at MAM. Trained Dossets lead tours in the spirit of exploration. Bring your curiosity to an open mind. They do have online um, uh, downloads for you to listen to it through your headphones. If you want to go in any time, it's free admission, free expression. That is their uh, go-to. It's one of the few art museums in the nation that just allows people just to kind of walk in and enjoy. And they uh, really depend on their uh, people who uh, subscribe or donate who become members of the resort museum for some of their money as well rather than just charging at the door. So Western Montana Geological Society Workday, Missoula Public Library, this is an ongoing event that happens the uh, Western Montana Genealogical Society hoax a work day in the Blackfoot Room, which is on the fourth floor, brings a part of a genealogical project to the gathering. Other genealogists will be working on their projects, so you can talk to them for advice and hands-on if needed. And uh, share websites and advice on research problems. So this is a kind of a big research day if you're independent and you're looking for some help, even finding tools to uh, better your research moving forward with genealogy. Uh, Animals, they're doing the 20th anniversary celebration at Karis Park, starting at 3 p.m. on Saturday. The Missoula Non-Kill Shelter is celebrating the years in Spani Spain and neutering your forever pets at Karis Park from 3 to 10 p.m. The celebration is for you. And they want to honor you by throwing a big celebration filled with live music, drinks, and activities for families, friends, and a chance to win some awesome raffle tickets. This is their way of saying thank you for everything you have done throughout the past 20 years. Um, DraftWorks is hosting Britt Aronson. It's going to be some multi-genre music, um, live music at Andrew, uh, with Andrew uh, Sweeney. Uh, it's going to be acoustic guitar. I believe that's going to be 7 p.m. at, uh, let's see, um, I want to say... Probably the old post, yeah, the old, ugh, no, no, forget <laughs> Okay, but anyways, Pepper is going to be some reggae music at the Wilma Theater Saturday night. You can't, we don't want to miss that if you like reggae, and we don't get that much reggae music here in Montana. All that class drag experience, Zach is hosting a drag show starting at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Bass is covered at the Old Post is going to be at 8 p.m. for uh, some folk music lovers. Solid State Karaoke at West Side Lanes at 9 p.m. And Groove Home is going to be at Monk's is going to be just doing some DJ music. And if you're interested in going to the North Side uh, to watch a movie, Moonrise Kingdom, the Wes Anderson film, is going to be featured at uh, the... Uh, Theater uh, at the Northside Theater at Head Start Park, which is a part of their Head Start School. Um, they usually project their images on the building, and you'll be able to enjoy that as well. And then wrapping up your Saturday, as always, you have DJ Chris Moon at the Badlander, just playing some DJ club music. So also Sunday, if you're interested in doing um, uh, being part of the uh, Windermere SUP Cup. Um, race down the Clark Fork. It's going to start at 8 a.m. on Sunday. This is the 11th annual Wintermere S 
SUP Cup, hosted by the Wintermere Real Estate, a stand-up paddleboard competition. So if you see a lot of people standing on boards, this is the, what they're going to be doing at the Clark Fork River all day, early morning Sunday. It's to raise money for the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center, empower PAC program and watershed education network. Um, also, Carousel for Missoula, Missoula is doing a fairy tale and superhero festival. This is a big event that's happening to raise money for the uh, Carousel for Missoula, and it is a great opportunity for kids to dress up and kind of do what's considered like uh, more of a summer ween uh, uh, dress up time. Just a great excuse for kids to dress up. They might even uh, bring in some expert uh, cosplayers and dress up artists to. Uh, join up for the event for the carousel. So, And also I want to give some shout out to uh, Gary Gillette, who is the director of the Missoula City Band. They're doing a tuba concert on the Bonner Park Band Shell starting at 2 in the afternoon on Sunday. It's a free tuba concert as a culmination of the week and confab. Uh, you will be amazed according to this post. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I want to thank you guys for joining this morning. And for uh, Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend.